Good evening, and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Pat Weldy with Merrill Lynch. My co-host this evening is Patricia Dunn, also from Merrill Lynch. Good to be here. Patricia, great to be with you again. Well, we do have a special guest that will be with us shortly that is an expert in the municipal bond world. So we'll learn a whole lot about tax-free municipal bonds from Mr. William Watkinson, uh, who will be with us shortly. Pat, let's talk about, you know, the market and, you know, valuation methods. You know, obviously everybody hears about PE and, you know, we know that that's price over earnings. Right. So let's talk about that E earnings you know what, what, what is, what's your outlook for you know for earnings you know on, on, on the market on, on stocks in the market right now well despite the volatility in the market right now mm -hmm. I have a very pro growth stance mm -hmm. and I feel that once we start feeling this economy improve mm -hmm. that's going to become a tailwind for earnings mm -hmm. so I think it's important right now for investors to be patient Let's get through this choppy water that we're dealing with. And um, the earnings are there because the, the forward-thinking key indicators are still very, very positive for the market as a well. whole. Mm -hmm. So the earnings are going to come. We just need to get that tailwind going. Yeah, it is. I mean, and, you know, for, for the viewers who might be less familiar, I mean, you know, what, what's the big deal? I mean, it's really a big deal. Mm -hmm. you know, the reality is, I mean, the, the stock market is the is the greatest discounting mechanism in the world. And, Correct. And, and what it's discounting is future earnings of companies. So, you know, if, if the earnings on the overall market or, you know, earnings on individual companies, if those earnings are growing, you know, then ultimately that company is more value. You'll be you're willing to pay more today for those, that future earnings growth. Um, and it's not one-sided. I mean, there are, you know, economic cycles that, you know, go up and down. There's good periods and there's dips and there are, it, it is okay, you know, if temporarily we have slower earnings growth than before or even potentially, you know, not that we like this, but it does occur where you can see earnings decline temporarily. Right. So that's, I mean, that is why it's so important. Let's touch on what you talked about earlier, though, when you mentioned the V word volatility you know I mean volatility is 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 with us it's here to stay yes um, and I think if anything it's 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 it, it has been and it will continue to intensify and it's you know it's really something we've talked about on previous shows that you know there's just so many cross currents there's so many things for a nervous person to be nervous about right you know, there's so many things for a pessimistic person to be pessimistic about you know, that it's creating, you know, a, a quick trigger, which is volatility. Right. So, you know, my two questions to you, Pat, with someone who talks to real clients every day, you know, how do you prepare clients for volatility? And then once we're entrenched <coughs> in that volatility, how do you help them through it? Well, it depends upon the sophistication of the client and how new the client is. One thing that I've made a practice of throughout my entire career is that when I bring a new client into the practice, mm -hmm. particularly one who has never invested before, I tell them up front, Pat, that they should expect that everything I invest in will immediately go down. And if that doesn't happen, they can put a lottery ticket yeah. on that one. <laughs> but uh, basically, Volatility is here to stay. The stock market is not like a bank account. It doesn't go up forever. It goes up and down. And you have to look at things through a telescope, not through a microscope. And if you're going to be worried about your investment portfolio on a daily or hourly or weekly basis, maybe you don't belong in the stock market. Because when you're dealing with the stock market, you're dealing with earnings over time. You're not looking for a return this week or this month. You're looking for a return that's going to allow you to retire to the lifestyle to which you'd like to become accustomed. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I, I call it, you know, what's the purpose of the money and when do you need it? Exactly. You know, and if the purpose of a portion of your money is retirement and the honest answer to the when I need it is not a year from now and, you know, for many of our viewers it's 20, 30, years from now exactly you know really what happens on that next statement truthfully is less important than some people make it absolutely so, yeah I think that's uh, 
I think that's good advice just to you know make sure you understand what you're trying to accomplish in the time frame that you have to accomplish that mm -hmm. so do you have time for a question from from one of our viewers sure do I have a question from Grace Tillman from Norristown who asks what is the difference between gross margins and net margins Good question. Sounds like, sounds like Grace is doing some research. It does sound like Grace has been at it. <laughs> and Grace, I would say, think of it in terms of what is your gross pay versus what is your take-home pay. Uh, it's similar, but it's not the same. A gross margin is your uh, sales, your net sales, minus what the cost of the item you were selling was. For example, you uh, are selling widgets and you're selling them for ten dollars but it costs you three dollars to buy that widget wholesale and put it in inventory your gross margin is seven dollars right. now net margins on the other ha side is as uh, comparable to your take-home pay mm -hmm. it is what is left bottom line after taking out all expenses because your expense was not limited to three dollars right. you had payroll expense you had overhead expense you had utility expense you had advertising expense right. you might have had interest expense on <coughs> loans that you took out to run this business it taxes get included in there uh, dividends paid on preferred stocks come out of there, not dividends on common stocks. Interest on bonds that the company has outstanding. So after all of these expenses, what's left is your net margin. <coughs> Very good. Grace, hopefully that was clear to you. Appreciate your question. For those that do have questions, we love to get them and we love to give you the answers that, that, that you're looking for. So here's how you can send us questions when you do have them. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, TV dot com. Well, thank you, and welcome back. <clears throat> as I said earlier, we do have a special guest this evening. I want to introduce to you Mr. William Watkinson, CEO of Watkinson Capital Advisors. May I call you Bill? Bill, how are you? Sure, Pat. Patricia. Good to be with you. For the viewers that might be less familiar, and obviously Bill is the expert and he'll tell us a lot more about it, but I mean, a municipal bond is a bond issued by a municipality, and the interest that you receive <coughs> on that bond is exempt from federal taxes, and if it's with a bond within the state you reside, it's also exempt from state taxes. So. So let's talk about you know something that has changed a lot in the last seven years municipal bond insurance what's happening or what happened in the municipal bond insurance world and what's the current status of that okay um, municipal bond insurance came in vogue around 1980 give or take and it was very inexpensive for an authority a county to add insurance which was typically MBIA, FIDGIC, or AMBAC, and it was very inexpensive for them to insure a bond that may be BAA rated or A rated or AA rated, and by wrapping it with insurance, it would get a AAA rating by both services. Unfortunately, standard and Moody's. <clears throat> Moody's and Standard and Poor's. Correct. Right. So everything was going along fine, and, and today there's more and more municipal bonds are using insurance, more authorities that are using insurance again. Okay. But what happened in the interim was, beginning in 06 and 07, they started to insure more risky corporate bonds, mortgages, and as a result, they, they used to be called monoline insurance companies because they only would insure municipal bonds. The AMBACs, the MBAs, mm, and the FGICs that you mentioned, okay. So those companies would insure municipal bonds, 
and they just expanded their market to risky corporates and some of these insurance companies failed. Mm -hmm. So today you have a short guarantee, you have Nat Re, and you have Build America Mutual, BAM. They're deep-pocketed, well-managed insurance companies, and there's been a resurgence for municipal bond authorities to use insurance. Now, are those three, Bill, that you mentioned, are mm -hmm. they monoline insurance companies? They're monoline. Okay. That's correct. Like the others used to be. Correct. Okay. MBIA, they split the company in two, and you had all the toxic debt over here, and then they had the municipal debt over here, Okay. and that's called Nat Re. Gotcha. So the question is, is it worth anything today? Right. Is it worth having insurance on your municipal bonds? Well, in the last five years, there's been hundreds of millions of dollars of bonds that were insured that have been retired. They've matured, they've been called. So right. that's literally hundreds of millions of dollars of liability, which is off the balance sheet Correct. of these companies. Right. So they're strong, they're focused, and uh, you really don't pay up for municipal bond insurance. As a professional, you always look at the underlying ratings. Right. And there's there's so few defaults in municipal bonds, mm -hmm. but it's growing by five to eight percent a year now. So it's definitely a it's an add-on. It's worth something that you don't pay very much for. Okay. Particularly yeah. if you purchase a triple B rated credit, uh, a bond that's rated just above investment grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in municipal bonds always hold to place because <coughs> people fear taxes, and this is a safe haven for them. But we've come <coughs> off of 30 years of falling interest rates, and now we're into a rising interest rate environment. Can you talk to us about whether or not there's any advantage to buying a high coupon bond uh, and paying a premium <coughs> price to the call date? Okay, we as professional municipal bond portfolio managers, we like to buy premium bonds. We like to buy bonds that are trading well over par. Uh, that's where you find value in the marketplace. We are paid to invest our clients' money and get a better return than the average municipal bond offers. You can do that by buying and getting over the psychological hurdle of paying a premium. Let's say a bond is trading at par, a, price that, a bond that might be priced today. That would be a 3% coupon at par maybe in 12 years. Mm -hmm. The par for our viewers means a $1,000 bond is selling for $1,000. Correct. Sorry, Bill. Go ahead. <clears throat> so if you were to buy a bond that has a 15-year maturity priced to a 7 or 8 or 9-year call, you're going to get dramatically more yield because you're, you're being paid for the risk that your bond might be called in 7, 8, 9, or 10 years. So what you want to do is <clears throat> there's always less demand for premium bonds, and as a result, the yields are higher, less demand. Right. People think because they pay $120 or $1,200 for a bond, and when it matures, they only get $1,000 for that bond, that they lost $200 <laughs> per bond. Correct. Ten bonds, $2,000, they don't like that. However, you're more than compensated by the amount of interest that you earn with the larger coupon every six months. And every, bit of do every dollar that you spend over the $1,000 <clears> is also earning at that higher rate of return. These are called cushion bonds. Because if a bond is trading at par, let's say this 3% at par, and interest rates go up, that'll go from par to a lesser number in a heartbeat, quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where if you had a bond trading at 110, a cushion bond, and rates go up, that'll come down softly and won't go down as much. It's like landing on a cushion because of the big coupon. Right. So you have protection 
in a rising interest rate environment by owning a bond that has <clears throat> a five, five and a half, or six percent coupon mm -hmm. priced to a call. The likelihood that that bond will be called is greater because it's trading at a premium and you're getting that higher rate of return. Right. Typically what happens is, and the way you always check it, if I'm buying a bond that matures, a state of maturity of 13, 14, 15 years priced to an eight-year call, the yield <clears throat> to the call might be a 285. Mm -hmm. If I buy a seven-year bond that's a bullet maturity with no call feature, that might only pay 2%. Right. So there you're getting another 40, 50% yield by buying a premium bond. Mm -hmm. Individuals have a hard time psychologically making that, clearing that hurdle, but it's something that everybody should think about. Right. Again, for our investors, let me point <coughs> out the definition of the word call means when can the municipality pay off that bond yeah. prior <coughs> to maturity. They can pay it off at a call date. They can refinance it essentially. And essentially right. refinance. And also, in, you know, important, you know, these coupons, you know, which again, you want the higher cash flow. You know, the municipal bonds pay interest twice per year, every January and July or March and September. So you're getting that mm. higher level of income because you bought that premium bond, which is why, as you said earlier, that's why at the end of the day, you're better off with the higher cash flow now, even though you may lose, you know, all of that premium mm -hmm. over that life that you're that you're purchasing. Well, you know that when you buy it. No. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you always you're given that information when you purchase the bond. Right. And the price of a bond is actually the yield that you receive. People think in terms of price as I'm paying 103 for a bond or 110 for a bond, whatever the dollar price might be. But in actuality, the price of a bond is the yield that you receive. And if it's callable, you're always given that price to the call, right. mm -hmm. which is called the yield to the worst. The worst thing that can happen is it might be called in seven or eight years. Right. So that, that's one thing that happens. And in the entire arena of fixed income, municipal bonds continue to offer the best net yield versus treasuries, CDs, corporates, municipals continue to, it's a very robust market, mm -hmm. gigantic market, $3.6 trillion, very liquid. Yeah, that's, that's why I want to ask you about the, you know, the, size, the size of the market and what, what are you seeing like with you know, the current volume? I mean, is it coming from new people who say, geez, I have money and I want to buy bonds too? Or I assume a lot of it is coming from people that bought bonds seven years ago and they're getting that money returned to them and they want to go buy more bonds with that money. Is it some and, of each? And conversely, from the municipality standpoint, how many of them are floating bonds? And are they putting out new debt or are they refinancing old debt? That's a very good question because being in a historically low interest rate environment, which we are now. Right. I'll give you some numbers. I mean, in 2013, there, were there was $334 billion in municipal bond issuance. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, in 2014, it was virtually the same number. The difference was only about three or four hundred million. Mm -hmm. This year, they're projecting total volume to be closer to 350 billion. So the question is, how much of that new issuance supply right. is refundings, mm -hmm. where an authority has the opportunity to pre-refund or retire outstanding debt with a higher coupon and offering new bonds at a lesser coupon, saving the authority many, many dollars at interest payments. Exactly. No, no different than our viewers who have refinanced their home mortgages Good one, one that's right, two, Pat. or three times. Absolutely. Okay. So, for the first quarter of this, of, uh, of this year, there is 116% 
more volume in the marketplace, 60% of that are refundings. Okay. So 40% of that is new money mm -hmm. for new schools, new roads, but the other is simply a method by which these authorities can save money by paying less interest on the bonds that they issued sometime within the last five or ten years. Okay. okay. Now we have <clears throat> investors that watch this show and I'm wondering what your stance is on whether one should own an individual municipal bond or a bond fund. Well I might be a little biased because being a municipal bond portfolio manager we only buy individual bonds. We manage separate accounts. Okay. And there's a very specific reason for that. When you own a municipal bond, you look at your statement and you can see that you own a Radnor Township 5% coupon bond that matures in 2025. Right. You'll see the rating, you'll see what the call feature is, when this bond may or may not be retired. One of the advantages of owning individual bonds are tax advantages where you can harvest gains or losses mm -hmm. versus another portion of your portfolio where there might be a gain or a loss and you want to offset that. Mm -hmm. The main reason is even though a bond fund may yield a little bit more net in your pocket, the danger is it's a it's a perpetual maturity the bonds never mature right the bond manager as let's say it's a substantial billion dollar bond fund as bonds are called as bonds mature as money flows into that fund he has to put that money to work and the highest yield are typically the longest maturity bonds right creates the most volatility in this environment owning an ETF or a bond fund, and if interest rates were to go up, who knows, right. then as rates go up, bond values go down. Mm -hmm. If you have your Radnor Township bond, you know that it might fluctuate, but you're going to get your principal back in 10 years right. or less, might be called. However, with a bond fund that may be trading at ten dollars NAV, ten dollars a share, if interest rates go up the bonds in that portfolio will go down in value and as a result your the value of your fund can go down and stay there for a very long time. Yeah. Correct. If interest rates were to stay high you're going to be it could be five dollars a share which is what happened in in 07 and 08 Right. You know, temporarily when rates went up and then bonds sank in value, some of those bond funds have yet to recover. Mm -hmm. Where you know that when you buy a, an investment grade bond, you're going to get your principal, you're going to get all the interest that you contracted for, and at the end of the day you're going to get all that at maturity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bill, I couldn't agree more. I, I, you know, I <coughs> share with you before the show that this is something that you know, I, I think is, is very important that people know and understand. And I actually even, you know, use a little, a little bit different analogy to, for the purpose of literally making it crystal clear. I mean, you've laid out very well the certainty of owning the Radnor Township on it. has certainty. You know what you got the day you buy it. And you're in full control of what's going to happen with that. <clears throat> To make matters worse with your explanation on the bond fund, the problem is when that bond fund declines in value, you may not do anything, but if your next door neighbor does, if your next door neighbor panics and says, I want my money, the bond manager has to go in and sell bonds at discounted prices, and guess what? That's a permanent loss of my money when, in fact, they do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I can, I can, and I know you can too. I, we can talk about a pretty scary scenario. Yeah, you're subject for to, bond your, funds. to your uh, fellow shareholders' uh, panic yeah. and bad decisions. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there, there's no real advantage, uh, particularly 
when we've had low rates for as long as we have, it's hugely debatable if rates will rise. Right. But um, you have to be especially careful now with rates, you know, so low. I mean, I, I want to touch on, and I think you touched on pieces of this earlier, but why municipal bonds? Mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of bonds out there. There's corporate bonds, there's Ginnie Mays, there's, you know, wh why, why are you, sh did you choose to focus on municipal bonds? Well, I think the main reason is second only to U.S. Treasuries, they're considered one of the safest investment vehicles that you can own. Mm -hmm. And I always talk to my clients about the entire portfolio that they have, maybe of different investments, but I want them to think of municipal bonds as a foundation piece. So if and when we have another great recession or something happens in the world, typically when that happens, there's a flight to safety, which is a flight to treasuries, and oftentimes interest rates will come down because the demand is so great to put money in the bonds. But municipal bonds are uh, very much in demand today, even though the, the volume and the supply is greater because the taxes are going up. Your taxes today are the highest they've been since the year 2000. Right. And people recognize that, and I, I can't see any reason why they're going to go down. Right. But if you're a Pennsylvania resident and you can buy a Pennsylvania bond, which is free of federal, state, and local, and you always buy a bond and you think in terms of this is your staying rich money, not getting rich, and this is, this is your safe money. Mm -hmm. And if you are a fixed income investor, and it used to be in the day that, that most people would have to be in a relatively high tax bracket. Yeah. Most people are in a relatively high tax bracket today. Right. If they know it or not, it really works for everybody. And municipals used to trade at 85 or 90 percent of a comparable U.S. Treasury. You can buy municipals today that are trading at 150, 180 percent of the U.S. Treasury right. if you're a shopper. Yeah. Well, let's look at this now from the investor's mm -hmm. point of view. I see the purpose, but um, is there a difference about whether you're retired or not retired? Bill, quickly, we have about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I believe that, um, no, it, it works for everybody, really. I mean, even young people. I tell my sons who are in their early 30s, it's not how much money you make in the market, it's sometimes how much you don't lose. And when you have a certain portion of municipal bonds that are going to just continue to pay you a good, safe return, and, and you're basically supporting projects where you live, that's a positive thing. Okay. So retired or not retired, um, the net yield today is even greater than some corporate, certainly more than, uh, than the CDs. Bill, we thank you. We'll have to bring you back again. You can talk to us some more about municipal bonds. It was very, you know, very educational. I'm glad our viewers you know, were able to catch that. Our next guest on the program is going to be Mr. Matt Cabry, who's the CEO of Select Greater Philadelphia, which is essentially the Chamber of Commerce of Philadelphia. So stay tuned for, for Matt Cabry. And as always, your money matters. Thank you.